When I describe practices like trunk-based development, test-driven development, and continuous delivery, I sometimes get some pushback from people who assume that stuff like this only works for very simple systems. They're wrong, of course. All of these techniques not only work for more complex systems, but they make the development of these more complex systems significantly easier too. One reasonably common pushback that I get is, yes, but this couldn't possibly work for games. Well, I'm afraid that those people saying those things are simply wrong too. These techniques work great for games, even AAA console games. So what does it take to adopt continuous delivery and its surrounding practices for a AAA game? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. Rare Game Studio is part of Microsoft. And amongst other games titles, they're responsible for producing a game called Sea of Thieves, a massively multiplayer AAA game that was created and is maintained using continuous delivery. This is not the only continuous delivery game. There are others being built. Uh, this way, including Minecraft these days. But for today, let's talk about Sea of Thieves, which as far as I know, was the first AAA game to be developed this way. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to hear more about Minecraft. I first heard about Sea of Thieves due, uh, using continuous delivery in 2018, when I attended a great presentation by one of the team members, Jafar Soltani, who was one of the leaders of the team that built the game. I wasn't really surprised that continuous delivery worked for games. I think continuous delivery works best for every kind of software. But I loved the insights into the team's problem solving that was both impressive and also so familiar from my experience of working on bigger systems with the teams that I worked on. I strongly recommend that you check out the more recent version of Jafar's presentation. There's a link to that in the description below. The rare team that built Sea of Thieves was made up of around 150 people, including artists, musicians and developers, working over a period of about three years towards the public release of the game. But unusually for the games industry, they chose not to adopt the, even today, more common waterfall process that most games use, even though that approach tends to end up with lower quality code developed more slowly and leads to the common game practice of crunch to try to fix all of the problems that get introduced during the development phase to make release dates. Crunch is a games industry term for what is sometimes re referred to in other parts of the software development industry as a death march. Long periods of dramatic overtime worked by development teams to solve integration problems and fix often tens of thousands of bugs in an attempt to hit some predefined release date. I talked about this once before in my video on the cyberpunk game failure of a few years ago. Let me pause there and say thank you to our sponsors. We're extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Tricentis and Transfic. All of these companies offer products and services that are well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, click on the links in the description below and do check them out. The team that started out on Sea of Thieves was pretty experienced. As is common with game development, the initial exploratory work for the game was done by a very small group of people, in this case about five. The five people on this team were experienced enough to know that they'd rather avoid another horrible crunch if they possibly could. So they set out with the idea of adopting continuous delivery from day one. They'd already been experimenting with some aspects of continuous delivery on previous games, so had some idea of what this was likely to take. I define continuous delivery as working so that your software is always in a releasable state. And they took this idea very much to heart, organising their work to achieve that from the very start of the development process. That's a very good idea, because continuous delivery is actually easy when you introduce it from day one, but it's quite a lot harder to retrofit once the software is the wrong shape and isn't well tested. The Rare team took every opportunity to release even before the game was ready for the general public. First, they released the game internally so that everyone on the team could play it for, from very early in its life. 
Later, after about a year of development, they released the game through what they called a technical outflow programming, releasing to volunteers under a non-disclosure agreement who would play pre-release versions and give valuable feedback on the game. This allowed the game to evolve in response to what they learned from real players. Some version of this approach is actually pretty common continuous delivery strategy for more complex systems. During this period, and I think to this day, the Rare team released changes weekly. But as I said, they work to keep the software releasable all of the time, producing at least one release candidate every day, unless something dramatic goes badly wrong. Sea of Thieves is not a small, simple game. It's built with C++ on the Unreal game engine, and the build alone represents a technical challenge to complete in continuous delivery timescales. There is literally hours worth of C++ compilation here, and well over 40,000 tests run on every single commit. In total, they run around 4 million test cases per day, most of them unit tests, giving around 90% code coverage, but also lots of what I'd probably call acceptance tests, they refer to as integration tests, that test more end-to-end -end behaviors of the system. Like most other big continuous delivery projects, they have a fairly sophisticated build grid. Res version comprises of over 150 fairly beefy PCs organized to contribute to an incremental build and concurrent testing approach. This allows them to sustain the fast feedback that CD depends on. They've optimized and continue to optimize their build and test systems all of the time. This is another common feature of bigger, more complex continuous delivery systems. Continuous delivery is foundationally a process of continuous improvement. So the other thing that the doubters, the people who are statistically building worse software slower say, is that you can't practice true continuous integration for big projects and for games. That is, you can't do trunk-based development. Well, Rare disproved this too. Rare have been working on trunk from the beginning of the project and continue to do so. With a team of 150 people, gigabytes of code, millions of tests executed, and producing viable release candidates every day. 40,000 tests, and a particular problem for big games like this, over 100 gigabytes of digital assets of all kinds, as well as the code. All of these are kept together in a single repository, and the size of the project is so big that part of the optimization problem that Rare face involves clever use of different kinds of caching to minimize data transfers in order to keep the speed of feedback up. Data that doesn't change doesn't get transferred. This is true all the way out to users where the Rare team have evolved a sophisticated incremental deployment approach all the way out to the consoles and PCs of end users in production. Another example of this optimization is that artists working on the game in-house often use recent snapshots of the game locally while working on changes to graphics and sound and other game content. The other aspect of sensible management at scale is just the sheer scale of the data that they need to deal with. Something that we noticed on the teams that I worked on in the early days of continuous delivery yeah. on the first deployment pipelines was that a functioning deployment pipeline generates a lot of data. In Rare's case, their pipeline produces between 8 and 10 terabytes of data per day in the form of fully tested release candidates. So they have to maintain tight control and discard old superseded versions quickly. If you'd like to learn more about the principles behind building deployment pipelines like this, you can read my book, Continuous Delivery Pipelines, or study my training course, Anatomy of a Deployment Pipeline. There's links to both of those in the description below. Sea of Thieves is a massive multiplayer online game. It runs on PCs and on Xbox. But again, for code at this kind of scale, you need to be smart about how you deal with it. The vast majority of the code in the form of game logic is the same for both Xbox and PC. So they compile both versions from the same code in the deployment pipeline and test them alongside each other. Again, relying on sophisticated caching and incremental builds to optimize the process. They have a kind of device driver model for the parts of the code that are platform specific. So graphics, sound and input devices are all coded to the specific target platforms, but are still developed and tested through the same deployment pipeline. 
This monolithic approach is actually pretty common for continuous delivery on bigger scales in my experience. It has many positive benefits. Not least that although the kind of optimizations that I've been skimming over here are complicated, they're complicated in a more straightforward way than the design challenges of getting fast, straightforward feedback on the validity of changes in a more distributed, say, microservice style approach at similar scales. Sure, microservices is the most scalable approach of all, but it doesn't do very well with very high performance, more coupled systems like games or trading systems, for example. Before Sea of Thieves, Rare used to run a process of overnight builds for most of their games. What they found was that the feedback wasn't great. Often the build would fail overnight and leave the developers the next day in a difficult, unclear state. Think about that for a moment. As a developer, I commit a change on day one and that change introduces a problem. I don't get to find out that I caused a problem until the following day. Once I get the results of the overnight build, if I immediately know exactly what I did wrong, I can smack my head and fix the problem straight away. But once again, I don't know if everything is really fixed until the next day, the next overnight build. Now we're on day three. If there are lots of developers working on this same version of the code, the result is that there's a very rarely a version of the code where all of the tests are passing. So the state of the system is indeterminate, unclear. Ready to release or not? We can't really tell. If developers are working in different versions of the code on separate branches, they're even less likely to reach stable working version without lots of extra work. That's why continuous integration experts say, commit and get a result at least once per day. So this is what Rare do. Every developer commits at least once per day, and the pipeline is optimized to give them a definitive answer, releasable or not, after every commit, during the same working day. As well as practicing continuous delivery in the technical sense, Rare also do it at the level of product design. One of the drivers for this change in approach was Rare's desire to allow them to better be able to evolve the game based on feedback from players, as I described earlier. They did this from very early in the life of the game and continue to do it to this day, years later. I'd say that this is also common to effective continuous delivery org organizations. By working to keep our software in a releasable state, we are also almost forced to keep our software easy to change. We'd be stupid to do anything else. If our software is easy to change, we'd be stupid as a business not to take advantage of that and use that capacity to refine and refine our software until it delights our users. Continuous delivery is not just for simple web applications, though it works very well for simple web applications. It's not just for big complex software projects, though it works better than any alternative that we have found so far there too. Continuous delivery is how we build better software faster, whatever the nature of the software and it works even for the most complex of AAA games. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoy our stuff here on the Continuous Delivery channel, please consider supporting our work by joining our Patreon community. There are lots of benefits, and I'd like to say once again, great thanks to those people that already support our work here. Thank you, and bye-bye.